and speak. My name is Scott Fisk, and uh, I teach graphic design and web design at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and we're going to talk about the power of design. So before we get into this presentation, I want to get to know you all a little bit. By show of hands, who in here is a blogger? Great. Who in here is a developer? Yeah, sure. In any kind of de developer. And last but not least, who in here is a designer? Wow, a lot of designers. OK. Well, that's good to know. I want this to be sort of a conversation. If you will, please don't hesitate to speak up if you know something about the uh, particular issue that we're discussing. Uh, since there are a lot of designers in the room, I would be particularly interested in hearing what you all have to say. So please don't hesitate in, in sharing your thoughts, your opinions. I started in web design in 2004 uh, while I was in college. I was going through a traditional print program, and I just found myself uh, in a role uh, learning on the job how to be a web designer. And it's amazing. For those of you who've been in the field for a long time, isn't it really just amazing how things have changed over the past few years? So, so what are some things that have really changed uh, in regards to design over the last two, three, four, five years. No what are more stinking frames. Absolutely. The frames are gone. What are some other things that have changed? Responsive is huge. What are some other keyword buzzwords that we hear all the time? Yep. What else? Yep. Fewer words. Lots more visual. It blows me away when I look at web pages that are just so heavy and graphical. How can we be at this place? The internet, at least in America, is just getting faster, which allows us to be much more creative. And that's, that makes our job a, hot, a whole lot more fun. I did want to mention real briefly the AIGA. That's the American Institute of Graphic Arts. Every major city has one. Atlanta, Atlanta has one. I'm on the board in Birmingham. If you're interested in learning more about design, please just go to AIGA.org. And there's lots of wonderful uh, information on there. Plus, there's going to be one in your area somewhere uh, that has events monthly, and you can get into this, this sort of thing if you don't know a whole lot about it. <coughs> OK, so let's get the ball rolling. Power of design. This is what we're going to talk about in our 35 minutes. What is design? Why good design matters? Human-centered design, design basics, and how to get inspired. OK, so what is design? And I encourage audience participation. What is design, in your own words? Layout. Subjective. Layouts. Keep going. Come on. Get in the feel. Aesthetically, Aesthetically pleasing. What else? Visual effect. effect. Interpretation. There is one key word I'm looking for. Keep going. Effectiveness. Effectiveness. We're getting close. Storytelling. 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 OK, those, those are all good. Last one. Absolutely. We're getting real, real close. So Saul Bass, wonderful poster designer, also motion title sequence uh, designer, said that design is thinking made visual. And I like this definition, too, this next one. It's just visual problem solving, right? That's what we all do. Everybody in the creative field, whatever your position is, all those people that raised their hands a little bit ago about development, blogging, everybody in here is a creative problem solver. And that's really what's important today. That's what your client wants. They don't care if you're the one who does it or if you hire somebody. As long as their issues are resolved, you are a creative individual and you're helping them. That's really the key thing that they're looking for. And that's what we're going to talk about. OK, so why design matters? Because, and this is specifically engineered really towards web, first impressions count. Any guesses as to how many seconds, according to, according to Nielsen's survey, the average person spends on a web page? I just looked this up this morning because I wanted to double check. Keep going. Throw out some numbers. Yeah. You guys are all real close. 10 to 20 seconds, anywhere in that ballpark. And of course, there are some folks that are going to stay longer and some less. So that's kind of a, a ballpark. Brand manifestation, credibility. User trust, sticky factor, that's just how long someone hangs around. Uh, the return rate, of course, more sales. And most importantly, good design is memorable. And that memorable but leads directly to, of course, good branding. And what, what is good branding, in your opinion? Branding is everything today. You just, 
you can't talk about design without talking about branding. There are a lot of wonderful corporations, wonderful brands out there. What makes those brands just sort of stick out in your mind? Why are they always there? They're recognizable. They're recognizable. Let's, let's keep going with that. What else? Yep, they're everywhere. So there's the repetition. That's a key word. What else? We can relate to them. They're simple. Absolutely. What are some of those really big brands? What, what's the number one? Let's try to guess the number one. You guys are close. Atlanta. <laughs> Apple. You guys got it. That was quicker. So I've done this presentation four times now. That's the first time anybody's ever got it that quick. So congratulations to you all. So this is from last year. This is off the website Interbrand. They track this stuff. Apple, Google, Coke. So you guys are real close when you said Coke. IBM, Microsoft, those are all the most popular brands right now. And this is really the most important thing that sort of spurs on brand recognition. They invoke some sort of emotional response. So think of Nike with their, their TV commercial. And there's the guy running, and the sweat's pouring down his face, and he's hot. And, and, and what does that do? That, that embeds itself into your mind. And the next time you go to buy shoes, you're thinking, hey, I, I, could, I could be that, that skinny little guy that's running across the, the road instead of, uh, instead of the person that I am. So emotional response. It could be, it could be something that's, that's positive. It's, it's happy. You know, it, it could be something that's sad. It could be something that's, that's just engaging. But it really touches you at your soul. That's what good branding does. It tugs at your heart in a way that nothing else can. It's almost like going to a good church service or something. It just gets you very emotional. That's power, guys. That's extreme power. That's the power each and every one of you has when you do good design. You have the power to change perception. That's remarkable. I mean, it really is when you think about it. So good design. It's usable. It's accessible. It's usually fairly simple. It's innovative. It's engaging. We have branding. It's functional, it's useful, it's ex uh, aesthetic, and it's honest, and it's long-lasting. So something that I think about good branding quite often is usually it's kind of like a good friend. You can trust it. You know that they're always going to be there when you need them, and it's believable. And it's somebody that you know is always going to support you if you need that support. So a good brand is like a good friend in a lot of ways. So all good design is, and this is kind of a a loop back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, human-centered. And human-centered, in broad terms, is a type of user interface design process in which the needs and wants and limitations of the end user are taken into account. So let me ask you all this. What is the difference between user interface design, or just interface design, and human-centered design? User interface design and human-centered design, or UX, user experience design. Human-centered is about emotions. So the second one is about the customer. I heard somebody say, what else? Uh, it's more about emotion with human-centered. Yeah, it's more about emotion. One is mechanics. Yeah, one is mechanics. So, so the first one is kind of just doing it, and the second one involves, there's something I'm looking for here. Form follows function. And usually there's some sort of user testing. There's some sort of, let's put it out there, see if it works, and we're willing to adapt it. That's really the big difference between the two. So have you ever, and this is, this is fun. I really enjoy this little conversation. Have you ever gotten lost due to poor signage, failed to figure out directions, failed to figure out how to use a TV remote, or remember the olden days, the, the, the bad VCR, burned yourself when you thought it was going to be hot water or cold water and it came out hot, that's, that's bad design. That's not your fault. Somebody created that product improperly. And here's my little example for that. You know, just if, if you see this, would you think it's a pull or a push? Oh. Intuitively. Pull. You think it's a pull, right? Well, guess what? In real life, it's both. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> Somebody could be pulling on one side and, and, and another person's pulling on the other and who knows who's going to win out. So that's just bad design. That's not, that's not intuitive. Good website design is intuitive at the gut level. We all know how to do certain things. Many of you have probably seen those videos on YouTube of little kids using iPads. It's amazing, isn't it? Like little two, three-year-olds 
that have the intuition to actually understand how to make things work because the iPad is just so intuitive. It's so easy to use. That's what we want to do when we make websites. We don't want to have to retrain people uh, to do the stuff that we want them to, to access. We want them to just be able to use it without having to work at it. So this is a fun little uh, <coughs> game that I saw at an airport. I can't remember where, honestly. Uh, last year, I think it might have been Pittsburgh. And it was so intuitive. Notice the little icon where the little kid's hitting it? That anyone, no matter what the age, could walk up and they could play this little game. And it was, a, it was an ad for Siemens. And it was just a fun little branding sort of thing. It was a fun little exercise that made people aware of what, uh, what Siemens could do. And it was intuitive. It, good design should, should not be hard to figure out. It should be automatic and engaging. So what does good design do? Good design solves problems. We discussed that. And this is my little sort of breakdown for going through the design process when, I'm, when I make websites, or really when I do any sort of design. I break it down into three basic, basic parts. Uh, analysis, where we create the, the personas. You know, you have to put yourself in the audience's shoes. You can write up a little story about that, that, uh, that test demographic. You know, uh, John Smith is 33 years old. He works in Atlanta as a shoe salesman, and he would love to such and such. And you just come up with three of those, and a lot of times that can help you sort of put yourself in their, uh, in their mindset, which helps you design the site. Always think about the user needs. Always think about the context. When it comes to actually designing, I always sketch things out. Um, you know, thumbnails are just a whole lot faster for me than trying to do something on screen first. So I always do lots of thumbnails first. Then I'll do a wireframe uh, process, and then I prototype in Photoshop. By, by show of hands, how many of you use other uh, programs other than Photoshop to do your prototyping? Some folks use Illustrator. I'm just curious. Illustrator? Any, anything else? Envision. That's interesting. So there are lots of different ways to go about this. In reality, there's no wrong way. Uh, the most important part of this process is really the first part. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. After we finish up our prototype and we sort of bring that website to life uh, in HTML, typically I'll do Photoshop. I get the client to OK it, because if I don't, it's always a nightmare. So, and, and it's funny. You, know, you can send clients uh, the images, and if you send it to them as a link, it'll open up in a web browser, and a lot of times they think you've done the entire website, even though you haven't. Uh, and then you go through after they've okayed that, and you design it, uh, you code it out in HTML, and then I create a custom theme using WordPress. So it's very important to get the clients okay before I move into coding mode. Okay, so design basics. Grids, and, and this is just some helpful tips uh, and again, guys, if you have any other suggestions along the way, please feel free to, to, to throw them out there. Grids are really helpful. Everything is, uh, everything is headed towards a sort of sim simple, straightforward, lots of negative space grid. This is, this is very busy, so if you have lots of content that has to be displayed, you can use a tighter grid with more cells. 960 grids are really popular today. Uh, I am curious in hearing about how you all deal with this sort of thing when you're dealing with responsive because it just changes so quickly. But what's the beauty of a 960 pixel wide grid? Why do most designers work, at least uh, traditionally, with a 960 pixel wide grid? What's it divides down. Exactly. It's divisible by anything. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can split it up into columns very easily, just like we see here. And it allows you to organize everything in a very easy, uh, easy way. Negative space is really important. You know, this is the, the, the big release of the Apple Watch. It'll be interesting to see if that actually works out or not. Um, so, you know, Apple's, you can't really talk about use, good usability, good design without at least mentioning Apple, and they're real good at using lots of negative space. Brainstorming is key. When you guys are doing brainstorming, try to, try to keep an open mind Realize that there are no wrong answers when you're brainstorming. The obvious answers normally come first. So uh, when I teach my classes, I always try to start off where everybody's brainstorming as a team. 
they write down ideas, they do word association, we go around the room, everybody throws out lots of words, there's nothing wrong. This is how most advertising agencies work too today. Uh, you know, when you work in teams, a lot of times somebody else might sort of trigger an idea for you and you can, you can work back and forth and it really helps. Write down all of your ideas. I live, eat, breathe, sleep with my sketchbook. Sometimes you'll just, you'll wake up in the middle of the night and, oh yeah, that's, and you'll write that idea. What happens if you don't write your idea down? Yeah. It's gone forever. Isn't that horrible? And like a week later, you still can't remember that idea. It just drives you crazy. The shortest pencil is mightier than the longest memory. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So share ideas with others, even if it's somebody that doesn't know anything about your project. Be willing to just talk about it. And, and it's, it's just so strange how our creative mind works. Things will pop in at the most inopportune times, won't they? You know, it, you'll be eating dinner and you'll be, oh, I get it. I finally resolved that problem. I made sense of it. I figured it out. Do not be in a hurry. That's a key. If, if you have a deadline the next day, it's going to be really hard for you to be creative. And try to be inspired. So let's talk just real briefly about inspiration. Pinterest, you know, back in the olden days, we used, to, we used to get these big boards and we'd go and we'd cut out all this creative stuff and, and pin it up on a board. Pinterest does that for us. You can find just about anything on there or you can add to Pinterest if you want to. It could be logo design. Uh, whatever the subject is, you can use it as a, as a mood board is what we call it. Dribble is a lot of fun. What are some other good resources that you all use for inspiration? I'm curious. Inspiration of any sort. Album covers. Absolutely, album covers. So, and, and that's really why I asked that question. It doesn't have to be website related stuff. It could be music, so, so good catch. You could just be sitting there kind of zoned out. You've been working your tail off all day. You have no creative energy left at all. Just turn the music on, relax. If you are not, so have any of you been to like, uh, you know, a, a real fancy advertising agency? What do they usually have, what do they like? What sorts of things do they like to do at these? Or Google. Yeah, what's that movie about Google? Those guys. Those, yeah, internship. That's real. That's real, guys. They're really creative places. So what? Ping pong tables, pool. What else? Yeah. It's it's why they're not doing that because they're trying to be nice. They're doing that because they want the best from you. They really. They want as many people as possible interacting. So when yeah. they're designing the new campus, they, they want people, you know, flocking to each other's it, places. He's saying maximum interaction, and that is a trend today within a lot of uh, design firms and ad agencies. It's sort of opening up the workspaces and allowing people to communicate more freely between each other on projects. That's a, that's a big thing today. So be creative. Everybody has something that they like to do that sort of relaxes them, whether it be a walk in a park, whether it be swimming, exercise, that's what you got to do, guys. You have to block that time off because that's the only way that you're really going to be as good at what you do as you can be. And remember, creativity isn't just design. It's whatever it is that you're doing that's problem solving. You have to stay calm. When I teach my classes, my students will know the deadline's coming up, and I can see the, the creativity just going out of them day by day. It's just gone. <laughs> So anytime you have a, a deadline that's, that's imminent, you, really you just need to give yourself ample time to be creative. And I try to, anytime I do a project, I do reverse planning, backwards planning. You guys know what that means? You kind of start backwards. You're like, this is where I have to be back here at the end, and then you back it up. And I always try to give myself 50% of the project time dedicated towards creativity. And then I give the other 50% of the project time towards just the functional stuff, the business stuff, the back end stuff. Fonts, typography, this is a big, a big change over the last five or six years in our field. Serif versus sans serif, what works better on screen? Sans serif, it's easier to read on screen. What are some of your favorite fonts? Just throw them out there. Myriad. Yeah, Myriad. What's that? Verdana. Trajan, <laughs> Comic Sans, <laughs> <laughs> Copper Plate. There's some real fun videos that make fun of uh, Comic Sans and, oh. and Copper Plate and all those other bad fonts. 
So with typography, what's the key? What is the key thing that users want with good typography on the internet? Readability. Readability, exactly. So when it comes to body text, please just try to choose the path of least resistance and go with something that, that makes sense. When you're trying to be more creative with typography, what other text elements can you apply that to? Yeah, the headings, you can be a little bit more free. Subtitles, right? That's a good place to be creative. Line height can help a lot. Which one's easier to read, left or right? Absolutely. A little bit more room. Cloud typography is a big, uh, a big thing today. What are some different cloud services that are offered? This is Hopefler and Fear Jones. Type gets the big one. What else? Google Fonts. Yeah, Google Fonts. What are your favorites? Google Fonts. Google Fonts is free. If you have the, if you have the Creative Cloud software, they just started including Typekit, at least some Typekit fonts for free, which is really helpful. And it will seamlessly work between all of your software. It's, it's like magic. I really like it. So if you haven't had a chance to try that out, make sure you, uh, you give it a shot. You can download the fonts. You can use them in print project. It goes back to branding, right? You want, you want that multi-channel, uh, you know, cross graphic slice of everything to sort of fit together in some sense. So your web fonts can be the same as your, your iPad app fonts is the same as your print, print fonts. Don't be afraid to spend a little money. Uh, most of the good services, you know, the Google ones are free. Uh, if, if, I was, if I was a real snobby typographer, which I'm not, I've used Google, uh, the Google fonts before, but some people don't like them quite as well as as uh, the Typekit fonts. Do you do different fonts on mobile versus uh, desktop when you're being responsive? Yeah, absolutely. You can put them, you should do that. You should think about it. It's really a bummer to me that you can't install a whole lot of fonts on like my iPhone or an iPad. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. So that is something that you need to do. Always do lots of uh, cross-browser testing. This is a website that's called Awards, and notice it has www in it. It has lots of really good website uh, designs that are really inspirational, one of my favorite sites. And, and don't feel like you have to write all this down. This presentation is listed uh, on my Twitter account, uh, which is just Scott Fisk. Choosing a color. So, and this gets back to color theory. A lot of graphic designers have to take a whole color theory class in college. What is color theory? Color theory means that if I paint this room red, you guys are all going to be really hungry because red, it's proven. This isn't an opinion. This is proven. Red makes you guys hungry. What does yellow do? I have a little seven-month-old baby at the house. We have a, a room that's yellow, and he's always kind of sad in that room. He's not as happy because studies have, have been done on this, and it shows that little babies don't understand the difference between yellow painted walls and being outside in the sun. So they instantly start to cry. So there's lots of subtle emotional things that are sort of built into our subconscious that deal with color. This is called Color Scheme Designer. It's really fun. It has built-in uh, color samples. So if you know for sure you want to work with blue, you can click on Triad, which is a, a color sample, and it's going to pick the other two colors that fit that blue. So if I ever get stuck with color, a lot of times I'll, I'll go to colorschemedesigner.com and I'll just play with the colors. It also spits out the hex, which is really handy. And hex is simply the, the number, so you can plug it into the website, in case you didn't know. OK, next, color. You guys tell me, most good brands, how many colors do they have? Yeah, usually one or two. So if I say brown, what brand? Yes. Yes. There you go, see? You guys have, have been programmed. You don't even realize it. You're all robots to some degree. The, that's what good branding does. It just it, it embeds itself in your mind and you don't even realize it. So, benefits of custom themes. By show of hands, how many of you all do custom theme design versus template stuff? A few of you. And, and those of you who do that, why do you do custom themes? It's so much easier just to go and pick. I'm playing devil's advocate here. It's so much easier just to go and download a theme. Why build a custom theme? The customer doesn't always want what's on the box. Yep. Sometimes a customer might want something that's really different or really unique. What else? Yeah, sometimes out of the box is heavy. So, uh, yeah. 
It's not. <laughs> well, I, I like the custom theme stuff only because it does keep my, f I'm trying not to get technical here, but when I do use themes, which is, is quite rare, a lot of times it'll install a lot of extra stuff I don't need. Uh, like plugins that have to be updated all the time. So when I do my custom theme design stuff, which is how I usually approach my design projects, they're much lighter files, they're easier to keep up to date, and they're a little less hackable. And most importantly, they're branded specifically for that client, which is really nice. So here are a few uh, examples of work that I've done in the past. I made the custom illustrations that you see. At the, this is all custom theme design. Made the logo at the top. This is a, there's a video up here. It's a Vimeo video embed that starts playing uh, when you click on the picture. There's a little play button that shows up there when you first load the site. Uh, this, is a, this is one of my most recent pieces. This has a slider in the middle and there are different photographs for this uh, art gallery slash frame shop. It, it also has WooCommerce on it, which is really helpful, as you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, this is a law website. And the photographs really make a big difference, don't they? Photographs are a lot of what we, we sort of uh, gravitate towards with good web design. What makes photography so important? Why are we, why are we inherently so photographically natured? Why is that? We think in pictures. Yeah, we do. We, when, when you dream, do you dream in words? You, you might have words kind of going on, but really, what do you remember when you wake up? It's the colors. It's the, the imagery, right? Absolutely. And every, you know, I call it the, uh, the younger generation in particular. I sort of call them the, the Twitter generation. It's not just Twitter that's, uh, that's short and quick. Everything about everybody's lives today is just so abbreviated. Don't you feel over, I feel overwhelmed a lot of the time. There's just so much media out there between Facebook, what you see on the news, uh, Twitter. It, it, you know, we're constantly being bombarded. And what you have to do any time that you're being creative is kind of box, box yourself off, disconnect, and relax and really kind of enjoy life a little bit. Uh, but, but getting back to photography, just realize that's an important part of the, the equation. And hopefully some of you had a chance to, to go to the photo talk that took place today. What are some good resources for learning about photography? If you're interested. Pin, yeah, Instagram, Pinterest. Yeah, there was a, a talk. <laughs> yeah. What is your philosophy on choosing a picture uh, when the service provides various things they do? That's a good question. I, I was actually an Army Reserve photographer in Iraq uh, for a year. So I spent, spent the year embedding with units in Iraq. And I, it, was, it was an awful experience in some ways. But in a photographic sense, it was quite, quite interesting just to see all of the different things that were happening over there a few years ago. And, Photography is really uh, impactful today. A lot of, there's kind of a, a recent trend with a lot of folks to use stock. And the one drawback with stock, of course, is it's not going to be specifically engineered for that need. Uh, so what I usually tell folks is look at stock to get ideas and then just go shoot it yourself. And, and, uh, and then you can make sure that it's exactly what you need for that use. But if you're in a hurry and you don't have, the, it all comes down to budget, right, guys? Every time, whatever it is. So you just, you just have to make those decisions based on your budget. Right, but if somebody does design work and manufacturing work and repair work, and you have to show one picture, which one do you choose? Or Right. Well, what do you all think? Pick a couple in Photoshop. You, you could create a collage with a grid. Remember, we talked about grids. Or you could do something like a slider. Some of those websites had sliders on them. Uh, my clients usually like to put multiple things on the home page, so I end up implementing a slider probably half the time. So how do we track all this? How do you really know if you're doing things right? Analytics, what else? What are some other methods for sort of tracking success or failure? Conversion rates. Survey. You could survey, absolutely. You could sit down and interview. There's qualitative and quantitative ways of doing this, so you can conduct interviews. These are some of my favorite books 
on this particular subject. The don't make me think one is really down to earth uh, and easy. Nielsen has a lot of good stuff on the internet. You really don't even have to buy the book. You can get a lot of his stuff off of his website. Any other good books that are worth mentioning that deal with just good user experience design, good usability? Yeah, what's that one called? I, I own that book. I have it on my shelf. I can't remember what it's called. It's not. It is, it's like the psychology, the psychology of uh, somebody's going to look it up of design, I think. And it's it's very much like that's where I pulled the example out of that book for the the hot water faucet thing. Exactly. Yep, absolutely. This is my favorite color book. Pan, this is kind of creepy. All of you have probably used the Pantone chart to pick out Pantone colors, like for your house. They own copyrights on all those colors. Isn't that creepy? They really do. Uh, they have certain mixtures that make that color really accurate. But this is fun because it has a different, a, a whole chapter dedicated to like red. And it gives you the message, the meaning, and it tells you how that's really meant to be used psychologically. So that's a fun book. And really, that's it. Time for questions. Thanks. Comments? Oh, what's the name of the book? Design of Everyday Things. It's called The Design of Everyday Things. And that's just a good overarching book about the power of design in our lives, every aspect of our lives. Yep. When it comes to interior pages, just the content of that, what's your thoughts about um, filling it up with like, you know, occasional graphics? Photos, not just that one photo at the top, but you know, a graphic or an infographic inside. Yeah. I'd love to know how you all do. This is how I, I deal with that sort of thing. When I get my clients uh, sign off to design on a website, I will put a lot of time into the home page and then I'll make one sub page template. And I will sort of lay that out in a general sense as to how all the other sub pages are going to work functionally. Uh, but then sometimes I'll go ahead and, and finish out the rest of the site, and I'm like, it's just, they're all too similar. And I have to go back and I have to change things up. <laughs> and, you know, clients are becoming inc increasingly picky and aware, and this is a good thing, uh, aware of design. We've come so far as a society, and I think a lot of people are aware of what good design is. So a little bit of variety is good, just not to the point where it feels, you know, like it's a different... Right. Does adding that kind of stuff, and then when it goes responsive, it goes to mobile, start cluttering up, or it's not worth doing? Did everybody hear the question? What if, what if you put in a pull quote and a couple extra pictures that are laid out in a unique way? Well, the great thing about responsive is you could drop out anything you want. You know, you just you put in the tag that drops that column out. So I would drop out the pull quote. I really would. And I drop out so, some of the less important images, but leave the focal point graphic. Question in the back. I'm, I'm one of those who uh, creates the content uh, with my clients and all that. And so I work with designers, and one of the things that we get into battle is my argument is that content should drive design. Absolutely. Content is king. We've all heard that, right? So, so it's about, wouldn't you all agree today it's kind of a balance? Mm -hmm. So what, what does Yost say about content? Some of y'all went to the Yoast. I didn't make it to the Yoast. I just know this because I use Yoast on every site that I make. What's the minimum word count on a page? Yeah, it, it has it listed in there. There's a minimum word count. So when it comes to content, it's just not going to show up unless you do it right on Google. It's not going to be found through SEO. And that's what people are going to the darn site for. So yes, content is king. But remember, content can also be a visual illustration of how to make something. It could be directions that show you how to make something happen, to put together an IKEA piece of furniture. So sometimes content might be visual in nature or an illustration. Sometimes content could be video. So as time goes on, we're becoming much more and more sophisticated in, I think our, our site visitors are becoming more sophisticated in what they expect out of the variety of content. Wouldn't you all agree with that? Other questions? What is the minimum? The minimum, I, I can't remember. That's why I asked you. Three to 500. And then Yoast goes to a green light and says thumbs up so it doesn't fail you, which I, I love Yoast. It's a great, great program. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much.